downloadable content is a tricky proposition. When it's good, it's a precious extra serving of a game we already love. When it's bad, it feels like a piece of the game we already paid for has been carved off and held to ransom, like someone nicking one of the crayons from your Crayola box and selling it back to you. That was a rough day at school. But on the rare occasion that DLC is really, really good, it can even go so far as improving on the original game. Today we're here to salute those very special DLCs that were incredibly better than the main game. And you should watch out for spoilers for the following. The original Bioshock was great! So many incredible moments like seeing a big daddy and little sister for the first time, the Fontaine reveal, would you kindly, eating food you found on corpses. Come where I can see you! Classic, which is why for many people, Bioshock 2 was something of a disappointment. Unlike the third game, Bioshock Infinite, with its new city to explore, Bioshock 2 was a return to Rapture, a location whose story felt finished. It introduced a new character, a big daddy who lacked any kind of discernible personality, and had gameplay that felt like a retread of what we'd all exhausted three years prior in the original game. In that suit, even the ocean cannot harm you. This is good. But Rapture is the death of many great men. Alone, you will not last long. You can still reach the train station. Find me there. It wasn't bad, it just failed to live up to the high standards set by its predecessor. Even if it did, still let you eat food you found on corpses. Yeah, yeah, seen it all before, mate. But though Bioshock 2 may have initially failed to impress, its DLC, Minerva's Den, is routinely cited as one of the best pieces of DLC of all time. A small story-focused expansion, Minerva's Den casts you as a new Big Daddy, Subject Sigma, who enters Rapture at the behest of a scientist named Charles Milton Porter. Hello, Mr. Sigma? Can you hear me? The name's Porter. Charles Milton Porter. Doc Tenenbaum tells me you're here to help us get the Thinker out of Rapture. It's not going to be easy, but nothing worth doing ever is. Porter wants you to retrieve the plans for his masterwork, a supercomputer known as The Thinker, which he created to run Rapture's security systems. In case you're wondering, yes, it does all get a bit system shock. Mainframe reactivated. Confirming user's genetic identity. Which is obviously great, but it's also a tight, deeply personal story as you, through audio diaries in classic Bioshock fashion, learn more about Porter, about how he tried to infuse the personality of his dead wife into his AI project, and about antagonist Reed Wall and his attempts to seize control of the computer himself so he could use it to predict the future. I mean, he's the antagonist in a Bioshock game. Pretty sure I can predict Reed Wall's future. <laughs> Quickly, take the Administrator Punch card from Val's body and reactivate the Thinker. Minerva's Den's writer and lead designer was Steve Gaynor, who now heads up the Fulbright Company, makers of Gone Home and Tacoma, both of which continue the kind of immersive environmental storytelling started in this DLC, just without the bits where you occasionally have to bore into someone's face with your giant arm drill. I assume I didn't finish Gone Home. It's that story that's the star here, though, containing as it does a twist that, without getting into spoilers, easily rivals the first games, and an incredible combat-free final sequence, which is way more moving than you'd expect from a game that contains so much eating food you found on corpses. Reed Wall. He and I founded Rapture Central Computing together, but the greedy bastard pushed me out years ago. You know what? I've come back around on it. Minerva's Den, you've done it again. Incredible, aren't they? I mean, sure, they look the part, but just wait till we get them out there. Trust me, you're gonna see things from a whole new perspective. 
time was, the Forza games were seen as stuffy driving simulations beloved only of people who knew what the heck a drag coefficient was. Then the Horizon series came along to shake things up with its music festival, its open world, and its far more relaxed approach to you careening off the road. So by the time the wildly successful Forza Horizon 3 rolled around, developer Playground Games was confident enough to introduce the most spectacularly wacky DLC in the history of the Forza franchise, the Forza Horizon 3 Hot Wheels expansion. A collaboration with the classic stunt track toy car brand, this bonkers DLC replaces the usual scenic Australian countryside from the main game with a towering wipeout-esque stunt track complete with dizzying bank corners, loop-the-loops and face-distorting boosters. Hi. How am I supposed to go back to boring normal roads after this? You've ruined your own game for me! With 28 new race routes included as part of the DLC, this is, we estimate, approximately 8 Christmases worth of the iconic Orange Hot Wheels track, all winding and looping around 6 islands. Also, for some reason there are dinosaurs in there? Giant mechanical dinosaurs. We spared no expense. Hey, if you're going to go off the deep end with your DLC, you might as well commit. The Hot Wheels expansion is a beloved, nostalgia-inducing childhood toy brought to life in real-world scale. And the best part about it? There's absolutely no way your parents are going to show up and ask you to tidy the whole thing away before bedtime. If the vast spaghetti of plastic track isn't enough to satisfy your childhood fantasies, the expansion pack naturally comes with some new cars too. They include classic Hot Wheels designs like Skeleton Hot Rod the Bone Shaker and the Twin Mill, which features two 8.2 litre V8 engines poking out of the hood. Two engines? What will they think of next? Three engines? Ooh, that's good. I should write that down. I was born 87 years ago. For 65 years, I've ruled as Tamriel's emperor. But for all these years, I've never been the ruler of my own dreams. The 2006 fantasy role-playing classic Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion is an object lesson in how downloadable content is both a blessing and a curse. These are the closing days of the third era and the final hours of my life. On the one hand, Oblivion gave us the very fine, very substantial expansion pack known as Shivering Isles, which to this day stands as one of the best DLC offerings ever made. But on the other hand, two words for you. Horse armour. This of course being the notoriously pointless overpriced DLC that gave you a shiny metal suit for your steed and became the byword for pointless overpriced DLC. Still, I guess now nothing can kill my horse. <laughs> oh no, my horse. But never mind that just now, because Shivering Isles is the expansion that other expansions want to be when they grow up. Released a year after the main game, this DLC caused a creepy dimensional gate to pop up in the by now thoroughly explored land of Cyrodiil. Here comes it's another one! Right. Madness! Why? Why? Everything is wrong! The gate looked like a screaming face and was surrounded by confused upset NPCs, but if you're the kind of hero who loves to ignore red flags, you could hop through the screaming portal face and be transported to the so-called Realm of Madness. Sounds chill. <laughs> This new realm, it turns out, is the domain of Sheogorath, the Daedric Prince of Madness, sounds chill, who apparently needs a champion to help him prevent an impending localised apocalypse. I've been waiting for you! For someone like you, or someone other than you, for some time. I need a champion, and you've got the job! Good news, you are just in time for the job interview for said champion with Sheogorath's snooty assistant. Speak with me again when you have made up your mind. The anticipation is almost too much to bear. Alright, Haskill, where I come from, I'm the hero of Kravach, so maybe less of the attitude, hey buddy? Thus begins your adventure in the Shivering Isles, with some 20 or 30 hours of new gameplay telling a story that span off in its own wild new direction. Mm. 
The new map was divided between the vibrant region of Mania and the grim desolation of Dementia, each of them diverse and distinctive, and in stark contrast to the land of Cyrodiil that you'd left behind. Also in contrast to the game that had gone before was the tone of this new expansion, with its twisted sense of humour that made the experience, like Sheogorath himself, memorably original and deeply strange. I'm so happy I could just tear out your intestines and strangle you with them! <laughs> cool, cool. But you won't, right? Cursed Daphines, their children too. And their children forever true. I call to the bloodless wherever they be. The Soulsborne games have legions of fans, and Bloodborne is arguably the most beloved of them all, with its intricate gothic architecture and fast-paced combat system. But if Bloodborne is the cream, then its one piece of DLC, The Old Hunters, is what the French would call the cream of the cream. The main reason Bloodborne fans love it so much is that The Old Hunters contains the most spectacular and infamously hard boss fights in a series that is literally all about spectacular and infamously hard boss fights. There's Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower, a badass pirate-looking huntress who uses her own blood as a weapon against you. Don't you need that, Maria? Then there's the highly aggressive and wildly unpredictable Orphan of Kos, who is so fantastically challenging you could end up stuck on this fight for weeks. Seriously, this is what Bloodborne fans call a good time. Our favourite though is Ludwig, a name that is rather understated considering he's a bizarre nightmare horse monster with vestigial legs hanging out of his butt and who screams like, well like you would if you had vestigial legs hanging out of your butt. <laughs> Did I say favourite? I meant to say, oh god, please make it stop. The new environments in the DLC are also brilliant, with the fishing hamlet upgrading the game's whole deal from subtle Lovecraftian themes to extremely obvious Lovecraftian themes. And finally, The Old Hunters also contained the game's most over-the-top weapon, the Whirligig Saw, better known to its friends as the Pizza Cutter. See if you can guess why. Alright, who ordered werewolf pepperoni? Ah, Duke Nukem. I see that you've been busy, haven't you? Rammed that thick skull of yours against the mountain and it moved for you, did it? I knew you wouldn't disappoint. No matter, I'll deal with you in due time. In the meantime, I have a few friends for you to play with. Do play nice now, won't you? Duke Nukem Forever DLC, the Doctor Who cloned me, features adequate gunplay, some moderately engaging level design, and only a handful of bugs and glitches. Why is it in this list of DLCs that were better than the main game then, you might ask? Well, because the original game, Duke Nukem Forever, was a broken, poorly constructed, morally objectionable trash fire. Yeah, I'm back, baby. The original game was so awful that even the distinctly average The Doctor Who Cloned Me campaign felt like a breath of fresh air. It had a brand new storyline featuring Dr. Proton, a throwback antagonist from the very first Duke Nukem game, and a brand new, less muddled plot that involved clones of Duke who were somehow even more dim-witted than the original. Damn, I'm looking good. No, I'm looking good. I'm looking good too. Quite a high bar to clear. Failed. Ah! Oops. There were even some reasonably funny inventive moments, like how Duke Nukem can run around on the surface of the moon without wearing a spacesuit for as long as he can hold his breath. <laughs> Don't try that at home, kids. Or, more specifically, on the moon. The little studio behind this DLC was Triptych Games, so called because for a while it was literally three people working in one of their kitchens. They're the ones who helped finish off Duke Nukem Forever after 3D Realms went bust, and then were tasked with putting together this story DLC. Ooh, that's gotta hurt. 
The thing is, after the main game had one of the longest and most troubled development cycles in the history of gaming, the Doctor Who clone me was whipped up in only six months after the game's release. Even more surprising, at just over two hours long, it was an impressive half the length of the original story mode. Just think, if they'd worked at that rate for the entire 12 years of development, Duke Nukem Forever could have been over 40 hours long. What the hell? No. Come on, no. This is disgusting. And thank God it wasn't. To Sam, the land of fluff and wine. Exactly how I remembered it. Like all right-thinking people and video games, The Witcher 3 knows everything is better with vampires. I would ask you to convey to the Duchess that I put one victim left, but you'll not get the chance. This was the fundamental truth that we assume led to the development of The Witcher 3's best and last expansion, Blood and Wine. This land has never seen such unspeakable evil. Blood and Wine arrived one year after the original game, right on time for Witcher aficionados who had already consumed the enormous main campaign and the first expansion and were still hungry for more. What they got were 20-ish more hours of gameplay in an entirely new map, namely the remote and lovely looking region of Toussaint. Oh. Stock send the whip away those running riot. The main plot threaded through this DLC took in a ritualistic murder mystery, aristocratic intrigue and dark family secrets. All of it ideal fodder for a classic witchering adventure. Don't let them fool you into thinking it's just another contract. At the same time, Blood and Wine differentiated itself from the game proper with its frequently playful tone and some of the best laughs in the entire series. Shout out to the quest where Roach gains the power to communicate with Geralt, forever changing the way we see our equine pal. Gotta say, I expected a young mare to sound... Uh, girlish. Based on what? Your vast experience with talking animals? There was a novel mutations system to judge up Geralt's abilities too, and a bunch of new monsters to try them out on. But the most important thing Blood and Wine did was give lovely hero Geralt at long last somewhere to park his butt after so many hours of wilderness adventuring. <sighs> I so don't feel like going anywhere. Sit here a while longer? So we shall, my friend. It didn't hurt that that somewhere was a luxury vineyard with a sprawling estate, staff, and even a stable for Roach. Yeah, you don't hear her complaining now, do you? Creepy sci-fi horror game Alien Isolation was a textbook example of how you should make a licensed video game. It perfectly replicated the design, atmosphere and tone of the original movie. That would usually be enough, but just to be complete about it, the game's two pre-ordered DLC packs, named Crew Expendable and Last Survivor, perfectly replicated everything else from the original movie. That means instead of playing as Amanda Ripley, you could step into the space sneakers of her mother, the OG alien exterminator Ellen Ripley, voiced by the original actress Sigourney Weaver. It's the only plan we've got. If you've got a better one, I'd like to hear it. Crew members Lambert and Parker also returned to reprise their roles as walking alien chow. My question is, is using the air ducts to move around? Sevastopol Station from the main game, meanwhile, was swapped out for the tight confines of the Nostromo spaceship, recreated meticulously from the movie's set design. There's the cockpit, the crew quarters, and the mother supercomputer. I spoke to Mother, and she's picked up a distress call, a repeating acoustical beacon from a nearby planetoid. It's also a more digestible length than the original game, which had about eight consecutive endings before it finally wrapped up its story. Taken as a two-part DLC, Crew Expendable and Last Survivor is the movie, brought to life in 3D on your Xbox. In fact, the only thing missing is Jones the Cat. Which is unacceptable, clearly. We'll let them off this time though, because these two brilliant pieces of DLC are the closest you'll ever get to actually playing an Alien movie. An experience we cherish even more given how crushingly disappointing Aliens Colonial Marines was. <laughs> Not 
No, I still haven't gotten over it. Ask me in another seven years. This two-part Alien Isolation prequel DLC follows the narrative of the movie closely, from the point where Captain Dallas is about to head into the ventilation system in search of the alien. You know, the primary air shaft may work to our advantage. We can lead it through down to the main airlock. The real treat, though, is that it lets you explore the claustrophobic corridors of the Nostromo, which looks exactly as you remember it from the movie, all while being stalked in an extremely confined space by the hyper-intelligent AI alien from the main game. It's an experience that is extensively researched, lovingly crafted, and so very nearly perfect. All I'm saying is, if they're going to leave the cat out, maybe they should have called it Cat Expendable. We did it! There we go. Those were the DLCs that were somehow incredibly better than the main original games, or so we think. Let us know what you think in the comments, also like, subscribe, and if you're feeling really fancy, hit the bell button and then ask for all the notifications so you'll get a notification every time outside Xbox publishes a video. Wouldn't that be nice? Also between now and the time we do publish a new video, why not check out this video on screen right now from outside Xbox? It's a D&D adventure, in fact. Did you know we play in D&D? Get into it. And here's another video from our sister channel, Outside Extra, who are also very good and thoroughly worth your time. See you next time on Outside Xbox. <laughs>